Hello, my name is Daniel Schoonmaker. I'm the Executive Director of West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum, the facilitator of the Michigan Sustainable Business Forum. And I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar today, which is being co-presented as part of the Michigan Sustainable Business Forum webinar series. Uh, for those that are not familiar with our organization, the forum is a collaboration of business institutions dedicated to promoting business pra practices that advance climate leadership, social justice, community resilience, and the creation of a circular economy. Uh, we host events and programs throughout the state, including monthly, usually in-person events in West Michigan, and the monthly Sustainable Business, uh, the monthly S Michigan Sustainable Business Forum webinar series uh, presented by Shoe I'd like to thank Meyer for hosting and sponsoring today's program, and we'll be, be, be joined shortly by, by Eric Petrovsky, who will be introdu in introducing our speakers here today. Uh, I'd like to highlight our next upcoming in-person event, our May Westminster Sustainable Business Forum Focus. Uh, we'll introduce local, state, and national opportunities for the public and private sector for the use of, the Mich of Michigan source, uh, source, uh, source recycled content. Uh, and it, fe it, fe it, fe it feature a, pa a pa panel of uh, expert trainers in 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 introducing how to, get, how to get started in these efforts. Uh, also, if you've not yet done so, uh, we're currently circulating a brief survey on sustainability and circularity practices for business institutions in the state. Uh, please do take a moment to fill that out this afternoon if you've not, not, not yet done so. Uh, you only have a few more weeks to do, uh, uh, weeks, uh, weeks to do this. Uh, finally, uh, please do consider becoming a member of the forum if you're not already. Uh, if you are already a corporate institutional member of one or a member of one of our regional programs, uh, a professional MISBS membership is complimentary. Now I'd like to introduce our program today, Envisioning the Great Lakes Without Plastic Waste and Prepared for Climate Change. To welcome us to our today's, today, 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 today's program and introduce our speakers, uh, as well as to, as, as to share a little bit about the wonderful work that Meyer is doing, uh, doing in the Great Lakes is uh, a past board member of our uh, member of ours and a great and a great program in environmental law in, your state, in, in our state, Eric Petrovskis, Director of Environmental Compliance and Sustainability at Meyer. Eric, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate the opportunity and really looking forward to hearing our speakers today. I wanted to give a brief. Eric, I think you were on mute. Uh... <clears throat> Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you fine, Eric. Okay. You would think after two okay, plus I'm years. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Well, what I wanted to do is give a brief update on uh, some of the work we're doing at Meyer uh, before introducing our speakers. So um, sustainability at Meyer is based in our purpose and to enrich lives in the communities that we serve. Uh, this has been an exciting year. I wanted to uh, give you an update on the four pillars of our program. The first being to reduce carbon emissions. And we recently announced our carbon emissions reduction goal of 50% by 2025. And we have followed that up with an announcement of our participation in a solar development in Texas. So we are well on our way um, to hitting that goal in 2025. Food waste, um, we've set a goal of 50% waste diversion by 2025. In terms of supporting the circular economy, we have packaging goals uh, with dates out in 22 and 25, and also set a goal of 70% landfill diversion by 2025. And uh, I have great news today in that we've hit that goal this year at a 72% diversion rate. So still more opportunities to come. And finally, the topic of our talk today is on Great Lakes stewardship. And so I'll jump right into a couple of projects that we're doing around green stormwater infrastructure and coastal cleanups. So one of the challenges in Great Lakes water quality is to solve issues around urban runoff. And so uh, we have two projects going this summer uh, to install green stormwater infrastructure at two of our stores while we're doing a parking lot restoration project. Uh, in these projects are funded by Eagle for the subsurface work. And another great example of private public partnerships, we've teamed up with the Watershed Center of Grand Traverse Bay for this project at our Traverse City store where we're going to be installing uh, underground infiltration in a large portion of our uh, parking lot, including bioretention to protect Kids Creek. And secondly, we're installing uh, a large bioretention cell at our store in Benton Harbor 
and actually augmenting that with a pollinator garden to uh, protect Ox Creek. So a couple of really interesting projects that'll be in the field this summer. A real uh, wonderful development we have this year is a partnership with the Council for the Great Lakes Region and Mark Fisher will be speaking about his organization today. Uh, we have uh, going to be implementing a real neat project to capture plastic waste at the source. So we'll be installing gutter bins at 10 of our stores. So these are devices that contain um, a filter sock that collect trash and, and other things that are um, found in our parking lots you know, before they hit our stormwater ponds or any municipal sewer systems. Um, an important part of that project is to launch public awareness campaign so that our customers understand um, the value of, of the Great Lakes. And secondly, uh, we're launching a really significant plastics cleanup project. We're going to be deploying B-Bots and Pixie drones, robotic systems to clean up uh, beach uh, services as well as uh, floating debris in marinas. And so we're going to be deploying these technologies um, at five high-use beach areas and four medium-large marinas in our footprint. We'll be collecting and tracking that waste data and again reaching out to the community to raise awareness about the value of the Great Lakes. So that's my brief update. Happy to take questions when uh, that time comes. But now what I'd like to do is introduce Drew Gronewald. Dr. Gronewald is a, an assistant or an associate professor at U of M with appointments in uh, the School for Environment and Sustainability and Civil Environmental Engineering, as well as Earth and Environmental Sciences. His research is aimed at understanding short and long-term changes in Great Lakes water levels including pathways through which climate change impacts the major components of the Great Lakes water balance. His projects directly support sustainable environmental and human health management and policy decisions. Happy to welcome Drew to the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum. The floor is yours. Eric, thanks so much. And just with a head nod, can you confirm that you can hear me okay and see my slides okay? Fantastic. Yep. Well, listen, thanks for the introduction. It's a real honor to be here with everybody and to, and to share some of our work and hopefully forge some connections with, with this community, the hydrologic science community and the work that we're doing. Um, and I, today I'm gonna to be planning on talking about some very big picture backdrop and context for a lot of the work that's being done with this group regarding Great Lakes water levels and water supplies. My perspective here is that the, the abundance of water uh, in the Great Lakes has so much to do with supporting different sectors of the economy, ranging from hydropower to shipping, all the way down to water withdrawal rates. Uh, and so the research that we're doing, I'm hopeful, uh, can, can um, elicit some great questions and ideas for moving forward together. So um, before I go any further, uh, I want to give you my outline here. I'm going to give you some brief introductionary notes on the Great Lakes, talk about historical water levels, and the focal point will be to look at the, the water balance. And then my final thoughts will sort of tie into assumptions that we make about the long-term water balance of the Great Lakes and how um, we might be facing threats to that as a result climate change and possibly even climate uh, migration across the continent. However, before I go any further, I do need to be sure to thank my project team. I'm very lucky at the university to be surrounded by incredibly talented individuals, including those on my project team. This slide shows some of the more direct contributors to our research on Great Lakes water levels and the water balance, postdoctorate fellows, master's students, and even undergraduate students who contribute greatly to this. And I also want to thank my colleagues at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, where I worked before I came to New York Michigan. This is a tremendous set of colleagues. Without their support, the graphics and the model results that you'll see here today just would not be possible. And then finally, I want to thank some of the direct sponsors of our current research, the Army Corps of Engineers, the United States Ecological Survey, Great Lakes Protection Fund, the Department of Transportation, and the Council of Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers, including generous support internally from the University of Michigan. So to begin with, there's a couple of key points I want to emphasize about the Great Lakes for this talk. The first is that, um, you know, holistically, we are part of this massive hydroclimate system that sort of dominates, from my perspective, the, the central landscape of, of North America. This satellite image that you see here is intended to underscore the range of climate and hydrological processes that we try to understand in our research to provide useful information about lake circulation and lake water level dynamics. So what you see here is across the Great Lakes in this winter image, 
Um, there's snow covering much of the landscape. But what I like to focus is on uh, is what is happening over the surface of the lakes themselves. You can see the formation of a lot of these clouds at the same time that um, evaporation is occurring. And in a sense, the Great Lakes almost form our own little regional climate. Take home message is that in order to understand the system, we have to pull together data, information, and model simulations from the land surface as well as the lake surface that cover two different countries. And that's a, a big challenge. Uh, another point I want to make to emphasize the magnitude of the lakes is this table that summarizes the largest lakes on Earth. So we have on the left the name of the, the largest lakes ranked by surface area of the country or the countries in which they reside, and then either their surface area or their volume. When I highlight the lakes that make up the Great Lakes, there are some important patterns here. The one I want to make um, for today is that there are over 100 million lakes on Earth, and nearly all of the fresh surface water, unfrozen surface water on Earth is stored in those lakes. 80% of all that water is in the lakes on this table right here. So when we think about understanding and studying the Great Lakes, it's not just for our own regional economy and for the welfare of United States, Canadian and indigenous communities. Um, it's really for an understanding of how fresh surface water circulates through systems across the entire globe. Uh, and I think that sort of is an important point to make when it comes to research uh, and understanding we're doing about the Great Lakes system right here in our backyard. So let's take a brief look at water levels just to provide some context. Um, what I'm going to show here is a slide of historical Great Lakes water levels. So on the bottom axis, you can see we are going um, from years all the way back here to 1860. And then on this vertical axis, uh, we're showing water surface elevation in meters, roughly equivalent to, um, to sea level. And so these numbers that you see here are elevations in meters. They're all scaled the same, even though there's some gaps here. So for example, in this top panel, we're looking at water levels on Lake Superior. Here are the approximate elevations in meters. For all of these data sets, whether it's Lake Superior, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, Lake Erie or Lake Ontario, there's three sort of data sets you're seeing. The first are the light blue dots. Those are the monthly average water levels. The dark blue dots are annual average water levels. And then the red line is the long-term average that you see across each of the lakes. So a couple important points to make here. One is that we here in the Great Lakes have an extraordinarily long and continuous record of water levels. There's really no other freshwater system on earth that has this long of a continuous record um, for a freshwater system, in this case, going all the way back to 1860, just truly extraordinary. Um, the other thing is we could sit down and probably have a dinner and several beers uh, looking at all the ups and downs of water levels over time across the Great Lakes. But what I'm going to talk about today are some pretty profound changes that have happened in the system over the past decade. And if you look very closely, particularly here at Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, what I want you to see is where my hand is, there is this period of pronounced below average water levels during which we hit record low water levels. And you can see in the historical record, there's really not another time period where water levels were so static, remained so stable at such a low level. In 2014, water levels across Michigan Huron, as well as Erie and throughout the system surged at a record setting pace. So over the past 20 years, we have this extraordinary contrast between extremely low and record setting low water levels, a record setting surge in water levels, and then record high water levels um, that just recently subsided over the past year or two. So let's talk next. I think what's important for this group is to understand what are the forces impacting uh, the water balance of the Great Lakes and ultimately the water levels that we see here. So what this slide is showing on the left are what we call the major components of the internal water balance of each of the lakes. If you think about you know, the, the lakes being like a bank account, we have water coming in, water flowing out, and what's left over is the change in water levels. So on the left, we talk about the three major components of the water balance within each of the lake watersheds. And those are runoff, the, the runoff or the water that comes in laterally into each lake from rivers and streams. That's represented by the green bars that you see here. We then have precipitation that falls directly on the surfaces of each of the lakes. And it's a, it's a take home point here that the lakes are so big that for Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, the amount of water entering those lakes is greater from precipitation on the surfaces of the lakes 
than water coming in through rivers and streams. That's, it's absolutely extraordinary. There's no other freshwater system on earth like that. And that's a, a, an artifact uh, of the massive surface area of the lakes. And then finally in pink, we have water lost due to overlake evaporation. So runoff coming in through rivers and streams, overlake precipitation, and then water being lost through evaporation. That's sort of the internal water balance of each lake. But then on the right hand side, we see the other parts of the water balance. Uh, first and foremost are the rates that water flows in between each of the lakes. So these green bars here represent the rate of flow uh, in between the lakes. So for example, in the St. Mary's River, there's an average flow of around 2,200 cubic meters per second. And I should mention that these numbers, um, just like it says up here in this legend item, these numbers represent flow rates in thousands of cubic meters per second. And they're all put in the same units just so we compare the numbers on the left to the numbers on the right. And as you can see, as we go down through the system, the uh, flow rates increase. What I wanna point out is that by the time the St. Lawrence River reaches, reaches the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the average flows can be around 10,000, 12,000 cubic meters per second, making it the second highest rate of discharge off of the North American continent, second only to the Mississippi River. Uh, and then, then finally, you'll see um, a couple of diversions here. These are meant to put the diversions into perspective. A lot of people in the Great Lakes don't have a really good understanding of how the different components of the water balance relate to one another. So these two diversions of water, in this case, into the Great Lakes, and then the Chicago diversion out of the Great Lakes, it's a lot of water, but it's an order of magnitude less than these other components. Uh, and then finally, I want to make a point here that there are other water balance components that we're not showing on this plot. One of which that's extremely relevant to this group is consumptive use. And I want to make a very important point that at this point in time, consumptive use across the entire Great Lakes Basin is not big enough to show up at the scale of the numbers that we're looking at right here. But it does have tremendous impacts locally, especially when we consider groundwater withdrawals and wells. And I also want to mention that there's a lot of research being done about the relationship between the future of the Great Lakes when it comes to migration of people into the Great Lakes, it's looking for a climate refuge, impacts of climate change, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then also the integrity of the Great Lakes compact. So much of the stability of the system that we're looking at here and the assumptions we're making about water withdrawals depends on the integrity of the compact. And I think that's, there's an important discussion to be had about threats that might face uh, or pose a threat to the compact in the future as we look at climate change and populations and migration. So I wanna make a quick case study um, out of the work we've been doing. But before I do so, in part because Mark is on the call, I do wanna mention that there's a, there's a lot of research being done to understand these water balance components. And that's a separate talk. I do wanna point out the, one of the interesting relationships between the research community uh, and the business and industrial community. Um, to understand evaporation, we launched the campaign over a decade ago by putting evaporation towers on top of old abandoned lighthouses. Um, and when I mentioned this to Mark many years ago over a beer in Chicago, uh, Mark asked how the, the, he and his contacts could help. And the solution was to install an evaporation station on the bow of one of the Canadian Steamship Authority vessels, in this case, the Whitefish Bay. So through a long project and a lot of effort, we actually put an evaporation tower right here on the bow of this vessel. And it currently crisscrosses the Great Lakes collecting unprecedented information about evaporation across the Great Lakes that help us understand the impacts of climate change on water levels. So let's focus in here for a second and take a look at what's been happening over the past couple of decades based on what we've learned. So I have three panels here. Uh, the one on the left, we'll look in a moment at precipitation and then evaporation and then the net amount of water uh, either gained or lost over the system. And these are presented in terms of what I call anomalies the amount of water either above or below average for each one of these water balance components. And for each one, I'm going to start from 1950, and I'm going to go just right up until about 2013, which sort of represents the time period um, prior to this recent surge. So here we can look at lake precipitation. The blue bars are above average years, the orange bars are below, and then the black line represents sort of a rolling trend. So here's the pattern in precipitation across all the Great Lakes. We then look at evaporation, including this period of pronounced above average evaporation that led to the low water levels. And when we add those two up, precipitation minus evaporation, we get this net amount of water over each of the lakes. And while there may be some interesting things in here, nothing particularly profound, or at least as profound as what I'm about to show you. Starting in 2014, 
the Great Lakes embarked on the wettest decade in recorded history. So let me add in the precipitation from this time period. So with a mouse click, here are seven years worth of extraordinary back-to-back -back precipitation. You might also remember that in 2014, there was an Arctic polar vortex deformation that led to very cold water and a decrease in evaporation. That's right here. So if we across the lakes in terms of the water balance have a surge in precipitation and a decrease in the amount of water lost through evaporation, the net amount of water across the Great Lakes goes up tremendously. And you can see it on the right-hand side here, just an extraordinary surge in the amount of water in the system and ultimately in water levels. So what do I wanna leave you in terms of some parting thoughts here? Well, what I see across the Great Lakes Basin, within the basin are these different demands on water in terms of its supply, in terms of its availability. In some parts of the lakes, there are problems with water abundance. One example is when homes are falling under water, when water levels get high and there's tremendous coastal erosion like you see uh, in this image here. There have also been situations like in 2017 where there was extraordinary flooding both in Lake Ontario and then all the way downstream to Canada, uh, the St. Lawrence River and the Ottawa River. This image on the left shows people evacuating their homes in Montreal. And what's fascinating is on the right, you see citizens in New York state um, pleading to former Governor Cuomo to violate binational agreements and let more water out of Lake Ontario, which ultimately would have further exacerbated flooding in Montreal, just as sort of a tremendous binational um, political situation here. But interestingly, if we jump to the other end of the basin near Chicago, this was a cover article of the Chicago Tribune in February 2021. And the, the headline article is just mind boggling, indicating the groundwater is actually running out. Um, near just outside of the basin in northeastern Illinois, in this case in the city of Juliet. So here we are in one of the most water abundant regions in North America, yet water is running out. And many of you are also familiar with other straddling communities across the Great Lakes that are looking to pump water from the Great Lakes basin to take care of either water quality or water quantity issues, such as the city of Waukesha, uh, and then returning to the Great Lakes basin. These issues of water abundance within the Great Lakes and water scarcity along the periphery of the Great Lakes, as well as across the entire country and continent. This is a look at soil moisture percentages um, from a recent image in August of 2021. The Great Lakes sit right at the edge of this tremendous gradient of water abundance that characterizes the Eastern North American continent, and in this case, the United States, and the arid Southwest. And I think there need to be some really clear discussions about the role that the Great Lakes are gonna play along this gradient over the coming decades. Uh, a couple final thoughts on this. I think books that most of you might be familiar with, Great Lakes Water Wards by Peter Annan outlines this well. And then a historical book that many of us read probably decades ago that I think is worth dusting off is Park Reisner's classic about the evolution of water in the West and California, Cadillac Desert. So I just wanna thank, before turning over to Mark, uh, Carrie, thank you so much for, for doing such a great job organizing this. Eric, thank you for the initial invitation and to everyone at Meyer. Uh, including Annalise for the invitation. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you folks. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, appreciate your fascinating talk. I think this goes beyond the science. Clearly, there are going to be major business and social impacts with um, the future of, of the Great Lakes. So next, I'd like to introduce Mark Fisher. Mark is the president and CEO of the Council for the Great Lakes Region. He leads the region's work to provide a binational multi-sector forum for exchange and collaboration on the region's key risks and opportunities. Prior to joining uh, the council, he served as a foreign policy advisor for the Privy Council Office, which supports the Prime Minister of Canada and the federal cabinet, where he focused on advancing Canada's interests in North America and the Asia Pacific region. Mark has extensive experience advising senior government corporate, academic, and NGO leaders on a range of pressing socioeconomic and environmental issues facing this sector, their sector, as well as pathways and dynamic collaborations required to address them. Um, it's been a real thrill to begin to collaborate with the Council for the Great Lakes Region, and I'll turn it over to Mark. It's great. Uh, thanks, Eric. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear you fine. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that great introduction. And uh, want to thank uh, Drew for that fascinating presentation. Uh, I've listened to Drew a couple of times now, and every time 
I see a presentation from him. There's just so much uh, to learn. Um, and I want to thank him for today's presentation. I think we're really fortunate to have someone like Drew uh, in the Great Lakes region. He is uh, by far one of the leading scientists when it comes to thinking about uh, our water today, but our, our water future. Um, and so for my presentation, I'm going to focus on the circular economy and some of the challenges that we're seeing in the Great Lakes region with respect to plastic waste and plastic litter. Um, and just to get us started, uh, give you a bit of background about the Council of the Great Lakes region. We were formally launched in 2013 as a binational organization. Uh, in the United States, we have two organizations, Council of the Great Lakes Region USA, which is a 501c6 trade association, and then a 501c3 uh, foundation called the Council of the Great Lakes Region Foundation. And then on the Canadian side, we have another organization called the Council of the Great Lakes Region Canada, which is also a, a not-for-profit corporation. But those entities combined make up the Council of the Great Lakes Region. And the organization was formed really to provide a forum um, that brings together businesses across a variety of different sectors with all levels of government, local, state, provincial, federal, as well as academia, the broader nonprofit sector, to really think about this region as a shared economy. Um, you know, if you were to take the eight Great Lakes states together, New York to Minnesota, as well as Ontario and Quebec, this region would be roughly a $6 trillion economy in US dollars. If it was a country that would make this region the third largest economy in the world behind the United States and China. It's a massive economy. Uh, it's North America's economic engine and it's responsible for over 50% of the total trade value between uh, that's shipped between the United States and Canada every single year. So an incredibly important economy uh, to both countries. But as we know, uh, the five Great Lakes, the largest freshwater system in the world really do form the heart and soul of this region. And so the council really looks at two things. One is, is how do we support uh, economic development in the region and ensure this region can compete and win in this, this global economy? But also how do we work together across borders and sectors to protect this natural resource for today, but also for future generations? I'm just gonna click forward here, just bear with me. And so if we think about um, that regional economy, Again, it's roughly 50, supports roughly 52 million jobs, which is one third of the combined American and Canadian workforce. And it's roughly 21% of the world's and 84% of North America's surface fresh water. So how do we start thinking about plastic waste and plastic litter in this Great Lakes region? I think it's fair to say that we need to be doing a much better job when it comes to valuing the materials that we use as consumers. Right now in the Great Lakes region, as it relates to plastic at least, we're losing roughly 12.8 uh, uh, million tons of plastic materials you know, to our landfills every year. Effectively, we're throwing out roughly $1.7 billion worth of valuable and reusable plastics every year. And this region, as we think about um, our recycling rates is recycling roughly 18%, depending on where you are in the region, roughly 18% of the plastic materials. And for in order for this region to get to a 50% recycling rate, we're gonna to have to capture and collect and process an additional 3 million tons of, of plastic materials uh, in this region, which has roughly a commodity value of over $400 million. And that's an annual uh, estimate in terms of um, uh, collection that's, that will be required in the region. But as we think about that plastic waste challenge that we have in this region, we also have a tremendous plastic litter challenge. Through research that we've uh, supported, uh, it's estimated that 22 million pounds of plastics could be entering the Great Lakes every year. In fact, in some parts of the Great Lakes, particularly the lower Great Lakes, we're seeing microplastics, so uh, broken down plastics and microfibers that have reached levels as high as 1.25 million particles per uh, square kilometer, Canadian number. Um, and those are concentrations that are on par with what we're finding in our oceans garbage patches. Um, you know, as I mentioned previously, we're also seeing uh, plastic waste being lost to the landfills and, and, and the environment in the form of, of uh, litter. And that's largely attributed to really poor material recycling and reuse opportunities across the region. So in turn, as we think about how we fix that problem, um, a number of studies suggest that it could cost upwards of $400 million annually to clean up and curtail plastic pollution, whether that's through beach and waterway cleanups, whether that's through new public, public anti-littering campaigns, the installation of stormwater capture devices to looking at more advanced recycling infrastructure. 
Uh, so a significant problem on the horizon. And so back in uh, last March, um, uh, almost a year ago, um, the Council of the Great Lakes Region working with a number of different corporate partners uh, and we're really pleased to have added uh, Meyer to this conversation. We launched the Circular Great Lakes uh, initiative um, with really a, a, you know, a, a sort of a core ambition in mind. And that's how do we forge a future without waste and ending waste pollution in the region with a focus on plastic? You know, it's a monumental task facing this binational Great Lakes economic region and the watershed. But we also know, as we've seen through the press and other, other research, that it's a, a major issue facing the rest of the world significant challenges ahead in addressing this issue. But we've also found that uh, when you look at the scale of the problem, um, there really is no one level of government or sector in this region that has either the power, the knowledge or the investment that's gonna be able to solve this, this issue on their own. It's gonna take a lot of collaboration, working through different supply chains, working through policy, re-engaging consumers, looking at the development of new technologies. And so Circular Great Lakes is really about how do we create this collective effort um, in the region, but how do we know where some of the big pressure points are? Um, so one of the first things that we did working with RRS, uh, it, which is a Michigan-based uh, consulting, consulting company with um, uh, extreme expertise on, on materials management, we undertook to do a, a best uh, practice gap analysis across the region. Uh, so again, New York to Minnesota and then Ontario and Quebec. And we really looked at uh, six best practices. One is, you know, how's the region performing around uh, collections? So that collection and capture pro process, uh, the processing of those materials, um, looking at end markets, uh, looking at uh, how we're doing in terms of educating and engaging consumers um, with respect to the materials that they buy and source reduction and, and recycling, um, looking at the region's performance in terms of supporting policies. Um, I think it's fair to say that in many places in the region, we still have uh, policies at the local state level that really do favor landfilling over uh, closing the loop and circularity and capturing and reusing the value in the materials that we use. And then look, finally looking at how the region is performing in terms of public private funding and uh, investing in uh, that infrastructure, again, whether it's collection or processing, so those material recovery facilities but also investing in innovation and, and those new technologies that help with sorting, but also look at how do we build in better recycling and sustainability in the products that we make as a region. And so when we think about building our, our North Star, um, we really, through the gap analysis, came down to three overarching priorities. One is removing plastic from the environment, which is consistent with NOAA's Great Lakes Marine Debris Action Plan, the Binational Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, which uh, just celebrated its 50th anniversary last week, but also the new environment chapter in the United States, Mexico, Canada Trade Agreement. And then looking at the second pillar, the second priority is about how do we capture value waste from, uh, from plastic. So that's about the, uh, the better, better systems for collection and processing in end markets in the region and trying to demonstrate and scale uh, different approaches to be able to capture uh, and reuse more value in the system. And then the third priority is, is achieving that net positive impact together. So again, that's, you know, how do we influence and change policy making and uh, consumer behaviors as it relates to um, these issues. So when we think about priority, priority one uh, and capturing the lost value of plastic in the environment by um, expanding initiatives like the Great Lakes Plastics Cleanup, which Eric talked about in his overarching, uh, sorry, his uh, introductory remarks, there's really two elements to, to this priority. One is a limiting land-based plastic packaging litter from the Great Lakes. And then the second objective is a limiting land-based cigarette butt litter from the Great Lakes, because we continue to find a, a significant uh, amount of um, cigarettes in the, in the region uh, on our beaches. And in fact, when you look at some of the beach cleanup data in the region, uh, between 2015 and 2020, uh, we captured close to uh, 5 million uh, different pieces of material, um, you know, from these from these cleanups on the Great Lakes shoreline, and and uh, you know, plastic accounts for roughly 42% of litter along U.S. waterways. When we take a look at the Great Lakes region as a whole, on both sides of the border, you know, roughly 80% of the material washing up on the Great Lakes shoreline is is plastic. So obviously, very concerning. Um, the most common plastics found, as I mentioned, uh, cigarette butts for sure, but also plastic bottles and six pack holders to food wrappers and straws and foam materials, plastic cup, bottle caps, just a lot of materials that consumers use um, um, when they're at the beach or 
um, in communities that are, uh, are near our waterways. So in terms of the second priority, which is looking at how do we accelerate the development of plastic packaging recycling supply chains across this region, you know, with a focus on flexible materials. Um, the first objective is, is how do we scale material recovery facility processing and expand end market capacity? As I mentioned off the top, in order for us to get to a 50% recycling rate for plastics in the region, we're going to have to uh, collect and process an additional 3 million tons of, of plastic material. Based on our current infrastructure, that's going to require 60% more processing capacity. So objective number one is really looking at the assets that we already have in the region and uh, trying to understand uh, which facilities might be uh, ripe for retrofitting or uh, looking at new investments in the region. The second uh, objective is, is how do we increase post-consumer supply of flexibles collected? A lot of our flexibles today, uh, unfortunately, uh, are hard to collect and, and end up in landfills. So again, this map is, or this slide really gives you a sense of the different types of um, um, materials um, that are accepted across the region and uh, the tonnage uh, based on the size of the circles. And so, it's, you know, we've got infrastructure in the region. We, we have material that is being collected, um, but unfortunately, um, a lot of this infrastructure is outdated in many ways. It can't uh, process the, uh, the, the ever evolving and the, the diverse plastics waste stream that we, we see in this region. And so uh, a big part of the Circular Great Lakes initiative is how do we work with different industry partners with government uh, to really try and build this, this capacity in the region, you know, alongside source reduction and other measures in order to better manage our, our plastic materials. And again, as I mentioned, you know, we've got roughly 200, over 200 material recovery facilities in the region. You know, roughly 20% of them or 42 of those facilities have the footprint, have the volume to be able to be retrofitted to deal with the, the, the increasing diversity in the, in the waste stream that we see. So our short-term strategy is really trying to see if we can get at those 42, uh, 42 facilities and see if we can make sizable changes to those facilities to be able to address the more complex waste streams that we're seeing in the region with a longer term strategy of trying to get to the remaining 82 facilities um, that have processing capacity, but um, you know, certainly not the size and scale that we require in the short term to really get at those, those large volumes of materials. And then, you know, we, we, um, we looked at the, um, uh, the, the municipal waste stream uh, across the region. And obviously there's a lot of great work that's happening around rigid plastics. And um, there's a long history of, of focusing on those materials, collecting and processing those materials. But as I mentioned in a couple previous slides, you know, where we're seeing a major gap is, is in the stream of flexible plastic material. And it's a significant market. Um, in fact, it's roughly two times the size of the PET bottle market. Um, so a significant amount of uh, flexible films and packaging, you know, could be collected in this region and repurposed and reused. Um, and we're unfortunately losing a lot of that value in our region. So a lot of the work that we're doing is certainly focused on plastics generally, but putting a spotlight on flexible plastic material in the region, because a lot of that material is, is just going straight to landfill. So what is flexible plastic packaging? So it could be your retail carry bags, your shrink bundling for uh, beverages, stand-up pouches for different uh, household products. Um, it's your chip bags and uh, you know storage bags and uh, a range of other bags that are used for, for consumer products, uh, you know, whether it's uh, pet food or, 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 or other types of products. So it's quite a diverse um, um, uh, stream of packaging. And unfortunately, in many cases, it's not being uh, collected and reused at all. And then finally, project three is, is looking at how do we achieve that step change in plastics recycling quantity, but also quantity quality through investment and deployment of both advanced technologies, whether that's sorting technologies, uh, looking at um, uh, updating our policies, but also re-engaging consumers in this uh, conversation around uh, the materials that they buy as consumers, but also how do they interact with the recycling system today. And then... Um, you know, if we look at the, the expectations of communities and consumers, I think it's fair to say that uh, most Americans are supportive of recycling. Um, you know, roughly 74% believe that recycling is important and should be made a priority. You know, 20% think people should do what they can to try and recycle. Um, and I think that there's a reflection in that number 
about the refresh frustration with recycling and and then finally six percent think it's just hard to consistently recycle um or that it's just not important but we're certainly seeing some of these numbers change the overarching message is that a lot of consumers want to see um uh, access to recycling for all products in their communities and then finally when we think about the education and policy actions that have to take place you know obviously we need to see better supporting policies to create demand um so it's looking at minimum recycle content mandates it's looking at um you know volunteer recycle content targets um it's supportive policies to st stimulate supply so michigan's got a bottle bill very successful but it's also looking at um, you know making some tough choices around landfills um, and um, you know container deposit frameworks and looking at uh, you know other measures like extender producer responsibility that shifts I think some of the costs and some of the burden of, of managing these systems away from counties and and communities and cities to uh, different parts of the uh, of industry and and sectors and then finally looking at education to encourage recycling and quality. We know that if consumers are engaging with the recycling system in, in an appropriate way, we're getting both the quantity, but we're also getting better quality within the system. And, and I know that there's there's a, a broad range of uh, you know, quality coming into the system right across, across the region. And that is in part due to a lack of definitions around acceptable materials. So people are confused. Um, there's um, there's spottiness when it comes to um, you know cart collection and 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 access uh, across the region, and so all of these issues in tandem are going to be really important in terms of how do we get from an 18% plastics recycling rate in the region, which is roughly where we are now, to a 50% recycling rate uh, in roughly 2027 2028, which is in and around where the US EPA wants the country to be nationally in terms of an overarching 50% recycling rate for plastics and other, other materials. So we've got a ways to go. And the Circular Great Lakes Initiative is really just starting. It's um, you know through its gap analysis, through the, the strategy and action plan that it's just putting the finishing touches on, we really are trying to develop a, um, a forum for um, those priorities, but also those projects and partnerships that are really gonna make the systemic change you know, in a region like this uh, in Michigan, but also across the eight states and across the border with Ontario and Quebec, where we see a lot of economic collaboration already happening, uh, as well as environmental co collaboration. So we're just at a, at, a, at a starting point. It's a really exciting time to, uh, to be part of the Circular Great Lakes Initiative. It certainly encourage other businesses, you know, on the forum today um, in Michigan to consider uh, joining the conversation and uh, being part of our journey over the next number of years in terms of trying to uh, create a future without plastic waste and pollution. And so with that, I will come to a close and uh, I'll turn it back to Eric. Um, I will note that um, we've got a number of partners, some of them based in Michigan, including Meyer, who are supporting our, our work, uh, as well as a number of different knowledge partners um, you know, across the region, but also Michigan-based, uh, RRS, for example, Next Cycle Michigan, uh, University of Michigan and, and, and many others. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Eric and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present some of the work that we're doing. Thanks, Mark. Um, your organization is doing tremendous work and we're really pleased to be part of that partnership and part of the organization. Um, I will pass the baton to Dan, who's gonna moderate the Q&A. Thank you, uh, thank you again, Mark, Eric, and Andrew for uh, for really enlightening presentations today. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes here for questions and I'm gonna uh, uh, moderate these through the chat. Uh, if you have a question for us, please uh, use either the Q&A function or the, uh, the chat function and I'll uh, try to get to as many of those as we, ha as we have time for today. Uh, I'm gonna start, the, uh, uh, start, uh, start off with one from the Q&A uh, tool and uh, it's a, it's a multi-part question and, and I, I think this could likely be directed to, uh, anyone, but probably Mark or Eric, uh, how would you respond to plastic recycling skeptics stating recycling is not a viable solution to plastic waste due to the, uh, recyclability of plastics and the quality and durability deteriorates over time. Uh, so the quote unquote, uh, kind of down uh, uh, down cycle scenario, uh, would our efforts be better spent on, and I think I would probably consider this a separate question, advocating for a plastic ban in certain single-use items rather than building out recycling infrastructure? 
And, uh, and finally, why is the education effort on consumers and not companies who are building these plastics and their products? Yeah, I can certainly take that on, Dan, and maybe Eric wants to add. Um, but I think all those questions uh, are right. Um, you know, in terms of recycling as a whole, um, I think it's fair to say that when a lot of people felt that this material was being shipped to Asia and particularly China, uh, after years of recycling, I think there was a there was a bit of an awakening and unfortunately a bit of a concern on, a, on the part of a lot of consumers about how the recycling was actually how recycling systems were actually operating and they weren't operating all that well. And so I think the concern is true um, and it's valid. Um, do I think recycling is uh, is an important response? I, I think this, this, the system itself can be doing a much better job. And I think it'd be far more effective than it has been in the past. So I still think that we need an element of recycling, a significant element of recycling, if we're going to be able to capture and recover that value in our, in our system, as opposed to that material just going to our landfills. Um, so that's the first response. And we need to, we need to re-engage consumers uh, just in the importance of recycling and how that system needs to change. I would say that, you know, um, in terms of single-use plastics and, and looking at source reduction, you know, those things have to be happening as well. In Canada, at least, um, and in some states, we're seeing a much more aggressive discussion around uh, single-use plastic bans, um, shifting away to other, uh, to other uh, environmentally friendly alternatives. Um, you know, we're also seeing that, um, you know, people are being smarter shoppers and smarter consumers, and they're demanding better choices and alternatives, you know, to plastics in the marketplace. So we're starting to see some of these things you know, happened as well. And then lastly, to your, to your, to the question about um, why consumers versus industry, um, the reality is that we need to be having a conversation with both. Uh, you know, we've got new initiatives like the U.S. Plastics Pact, uh, the Recycling Partnership, which is not as new, um, but we are, there is a big conversation happening with industry right now about how do you build in recycled content? How do you build recyclability and sustainability into the products that they make and ultimately put on the shelves? So that is happening. It needs to happen much faster, for sure. Um, and I think companies, you know, um, by and large, who are selling these products are demanding that change to happen. But we also do need to have a conversation with consumers because if that recycling system is going to work, and and you know, we don't have a, a continuation of what I think is a is a linear economy, which is take make dispose. We're just throwing a lot of this material away. We need consumers to be a, a critical part of what is that more effective and efficient uh, and sustainable um, uh, recycling system? What, is it, what does it look like? So we can't really do that without cons consumer participation at the front end and obviously having the right policies in place. So even though we, we support reduce, reuse, recycle mindset and, and a circular mindset, um, we still need recycling systems to really capture a lot of the materials that we are using and making sure it's not going into the environment or landfills. And as I said, you know, consumers play an important part of that as we try to get industry to make more recyclable and sustainable products in the first place. Yeah, that was, that was terrific, Mark. I think I'll just add to that, um, that it does require all elements of the value chain and including consumers. And so it requires a multi-pronged approach um, from the CPGs that put those products on the shelves um, to the to the downstream consumer who's got to uh, you know, take advantage of the recycling opportunities that are present. The uh, and I guess building for, uh, uh, bu building from there, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on the on on on, on this, Mark. The uh, you know some of the some of the 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 problem the problem plastics talk about plus plus film 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 and flexible packaging uh most specifically plastic bags uh, a lot of the more prominent recyclers in the state of michigan you know they're, they're trying to they're trying to get away from that for various operational reasons so like we have uh we have the state of michigan kind of sponsoring billboards to talk about how plastic bags are tanglers and, and as a result of these kind of various dynamics like in many communities meyer is the only place that you can that, that you can take them to drop them off. Uh, so I guess looking at that from both kind of a public policy standpoint, but also the, uh, the role of producer responsibility, uh, is, is there an, either an effort of, to get some of these recycling stakeholders to kind of reconsider this value as a value stream or to uh, uh, do we expect the kind of the corporate sector to, uh, to, to play a greater role in picking up the slack if that doesn't happen? 
maybe I can start again and, and Eric can, can add his insights, but ultimately uh, the, the waste stream, the material stream that we see today is, is a much more diverse and complicated stream when a lot of these re re material recovery facilities were, were built where, you know, it was largely paper and, 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 and glass and metals. And so that complexity over time um, has certainly made their operations a lot more difficult. And, 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 and in a lot of cases, you know, this, this flexible material is, is treated as a contaminant, whether or not it's got food waste on it or, or it, it doesn't, it's, it's just really hard to, 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 to process within these facilities, but it is, it's an important um, part of the material stream. And so that modernization in our facilities, just to deal with this material, because it is a valuable material in, in our economy, um, you know, has to be, those, those systems have to be updated. They have to be modified to be able to deal with these materials and whether that's, uh, you know, you know, new sorting materials, um, uh, sorry, sorting technologies and, and what have you within existing material recovery facilities, or it's looking at even just building designated uh, plastic recovery facilities that can just deal with the, compl the complexity of plastics in the region. So, so that, that has to be happening in the region. And then I think when you look at the, the um, you know, how do you recycle this material, um, you know, we're seeing, you know, some spottiness across the region in terms of, but I think by and large, it's, it's not an accepted material. And, um, you know, a lot of this material, this valuable material, unfortunately, is just finding its way to the landfill. So if we want to stop that, if we want to correct that, then we have to build the right systems, the right infrastructure to, and the right collection, uh, approaches to be able to capture that value. And, and whether that's, um, you know, sort of a, you know, county driven process, or if that's a private sector extended producer responsibility process, no matter which approach is taken, I, I think we need to look at how do we do a better job of, of capturing this, this new uh, waste stream material stream that we see before us today. So. I guess I'll just add to that. We know from our own materiality assessment work that consumers are frustrated by not having uh, outlets for their recyclables. And so we try to fill the gap by at least um, taking uh, plastic film and we recycle, I think, over 7 million pounds last year. So uh, again, it's, it's going to require a multi-pronged approach both on, on, the, on the policy end and consumer education end. Andrew, a question for you uh, uh, about, 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 about lake levels. I'm asking you to comment a little bit on the uh, on the uh, the potential economic impacts of the shifting water levels, uh, and and I'll add some context to that. Maybe thinking about this in uh, the challenges for communities to respond to the uncertainty, and and as a added question of my own, thinking about how we've watched it progress over the past uh, several years, the. Uh, the challenges for communities when they start beginning to respond to some of these things and looking at how to protect their their downtown development districts like as floods are happening or then as beaches are receding when it's on the opposite side uh any thoughts as kind of how to better prepare for economic uncertainty and to to to, to plan out these for these issues yeah, thanks for that question. And it's certainly a challenging one. Um, first of all, in recognition of all the different ways that we interact with the coastline, right? So um, there are so many different uh, uh, sectors of the economy that are dependent on coastal water levels and variability, not just um, the real estate market, but also drinking water intakes and the shipping industry and the tourism industry when it comes to ice cover. So um, the, the, the takeaway message that, that we've been passing along has to do with preparing for changes in the rates of variability in water levels. So the, the slide I showed earlier about these changes in precipitation and evaporation, um, essentially what we're seeing moving into the future for the Great Lakes um, are two clear messages. One is that precipitation is continuing to go up over long time scales. More water is gonna be coming into the Great Lakes based on the consequence of climate change. But at the same time, we're expecting long-term increases in evaporation. So essentially what we have are these two competing forces, one making water levels go up and one making water levels go down, uh, and they're both getting stronger. So what that means is that the timing of water level change and the rate at which water levels change, we expect might be a lot different in the future than it's been in the past. Um, so um, one piece of, I won't call it advice because it's not really a, a, you know legally grounded to give advice, but um, 
we really think that there's a, a movement to consider carefully how we interact with the coastline from a public versus a private perspective. Um, and that there's a, a strong argument to be made to, to consider setting back some of our infrastructure if we can from the shoreline and in cases where we can't to, to make sure that we are prepared for a wide range of water levels in the future, not just highs and not just lows, but a combination of both. Anyone like to com uh, like uh, like uh, like to co like to comment on the potential for bi di for biodegradable plastics to help uh, to, to, to help to help with the problems? The only thing I would say, Dan, is that it's certainly an emerging field of science, um, and a lot of uh, universities in the region, um, like uh, Michigan State, that are looking at advanced materials, are are seeing some really uh, promising developments as it relates to that kind of um, that kind of material. But it's still very much emerging and um, you know there needs to be some consistency I think when we look at what do we consider to be biodegradable because I think it's easy to put uh, you know a claim on a product but we've seen in some cases uh, something be called biodegradable and it takes over a decade plus for it to actually biodegrade so um, so I think this the science is improving uh, at the same time as we're starting to see a conversation about uh, certain standards and expectations about what does biodegradable really mean um, and having some industry-wide uh, expectations, uh, you know, as we relate to that kind of claim on a product. I think on top of that, it's very confusing to the consumer when we're driving recycling and then we throw in another stream that might be degrade biodegradable in an industrial composting operation, which of course, I think, frankly, very few. So um, I'm not a big fan of biodegradable or compostable plastic because at the end of the day we just don't manage it well at, at, uh, at the end of life. Thank you so much uh, Mark, Eric, and Andrew, and Andrew for your time here. Any, any kind of final thoughts or remarks? Just want to thank the forum for the opportunity. I'm thrilled um, that we could bring Andrew and, and Mark um, to our region, our area, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring them back in the future to get updates on these really important topics. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for for for, for, jo for joining us for joining us today. Uh, we'll be sending out an email shortly with a feedback uh, with a feedback survey and uh, recording recording our presentation and. Uh, Ways to be uh, way, uh, way, uh, way, uh, ways to learn more about uh, about the uh, about the various topics and initiatives that were shared out today. Uh, again, thank you so much so, uh, so much to Mark uh, to, Mar uh, to Mark and Andrew and Eric, and uh, thank uh, thank you again to Mary for hosting us. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everyone.